Hello. Welcome to Sabbath School with Branch Davidians. I'm Ed, and I'm here with my wife, Mary. Hello. We're excited you're joining us today. Yes, thanks for listening. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School Quarterly each week. This quarterly is entitled Managing for the Master. This week's lesson is entitled Laying Up Treasure in Heaven. It highlights the stories of the patriarchs who, like Moses, left everything behind, as Friday's discussion question asks us to talk about. Of course, the stories of Noah, Abraham, and Jacob are presented in this week's lesson, as well as the story of Lot's bad decision. So this week we'll be talking about the idea of giving up everything, specifically as it relates to the Sabbath school's theme this quarter, financial stewardship. In the past few lessons, we've talked about God's requirements in returning him a tithe, that is a tenth of our income, along with offerings, and we also covered the much-neglected second tithe. Referring to the ancient Israelites, Ellen White said, quote, No less than one-third of their income was devoted to sacred and religious purposes. Close quote. Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 395. Now, we might think that once we've given God our tithes and offerings, we've done our financial duty to God, and the rest of our money is ours to do with what we will. But is this really the case? If you've read Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, Chapter 3, the spirituality of the law, or if you've carefully studied Christ's Sermon on the Mount, you know that Jesus focused on the principles underlying God's law and thus extended the application of the law even beyond the minimal requirements of the letter of the law. As an example, Jesus taught that the principle underlying the command not to kill should also lead us not to be angry with others in our hearts. Well, it turns out Jesus applied the same principle-based interpretation to the laws for tithing as well. The fact that God has every right to require us to return to him 10% of our income reminds us that all that we have belongs to God. This means that what's left after offering tithes and offerings actually isn't ours to do with as we will, but it too belongs to God to be used for his kingdom. Recognizing this was one of the requirements of becoming a follower of Jesus. He said, quote, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Close quote, that's from Luke 14.33. Jesus had a lot to say that relates to this principle. For example, Luke 12.29-34 reads, quote, And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Close quote. Again, that's Luke 12, 29 through 34. Jesus had instructed those who would be his disciples to recognize all their possessions as not really being their own, but as belonging to God. He knew they would be tempted to worry that following these instructions would leave them without food and drink. But Jesus' promise is that if we seek the kingdom, God will ensure that we have everything we need. Giving up all for God isn't what should cause us worry, for God's kingdom has resources beyond the reach of thieves or destruction. But if our energies are spent seeking after our own needs, our meager earthly treasures will never be sure. Thieves or moths may take them from us, or there might be a recession. Jesus taught that it is only by giving up our apparent securities that we can gain them. But how does that work? As we read last week, Ellen White wrote, quote, The object of the words of our Savior in Luke 12.33 about selling your possessions to give alms has not been clearly presented. I saw that the object of selling is not to give to those who are able to labor and support themselves, but to spread the truth. It is a sin to support and indulge in idleness those who are able to labor. Some have been zealous to attend all the meetings, not for the glory of God, but for the loaves and fishes. Such would much better have been at home laboring with their hands, the things that is good, to supply the wants of their families and to have something to give to sustain the precious cause. Close quote, Ellen White, Early Writings, page 95. So we can see that Jesus was not encouraging us to give everything to the unworthy poor, those who are able to labor to support themselves those who don't tithe, or those who have lived recklessly. See our study, The Second Tithe and the Worthy Poor, linked in the description. Ellen said that Jesus had a different object in mind. His object? 
In Luke 12, 29 through 34, Jesus points us to the kingdom. Now, we commonly think of the kingdom, also called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as being, well, only in heaven. And while it is definitely in heaven, it can be on earth too, you know, like Jesus taught us to pray, on earth as it is in heaven. By all of Christ's followers giving up their personal claims to ownership of their possessions and instead devoting their possessions to the kingdom of God, all who join that kingdom will have everything they need. Jesus wants us to see that this kingdom principle is a great and viable idea rather than a scary and impractical one. And we can see this heaven-like kingdom in operation in the lives of the early followers of Jesus. Acts 2, 41-47 reads, quote, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as any one had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Close quote again, that's from Luke 2, 41-47. Here we see that the followers of Jesus did sell their possessions and divided them among all as anyone had need. It says that all who believed did this. And as should already be apparent from what we quoted from Jesus earlier, they were doing this in obedience to Christ's commands. Since it says they broke bread from house to house, it's clear they still had houses. It's not like Jesus was trying to create a movement that had nothing. No, they still had stuff, just not stuff that individuals claimed as solely their own to be used for their own pleasure. All of it was God's to be shared by Christ's followers as people had need. There's no reason to think that everyone who joined the early church had to move out of their houses as part of giving all. That would result in shuffling everyone into different locations for no reason. Instead, each was to recognize that their houses belonged to God and were to be used for God's kingdom in whatever way God instructed, which meant not selfishly claiming it as personal property, but sharing it with others who had likewise given up all to follow Christ. Thus, all of Christ's disciples would have the security of many homes and many clothes and the food and drink of all believers. Again, not to be used according to selfish desires, but according to their needs. So, in addition to tithes and offerings which belong to God, those who call themselves disciples of Christ should realize that everything they have belongs to God. And if everyone that calls themselves disciples of Christ has this kingdom mindset, we can have a money bag that does not grow old. There is incredible security in a system like this, as Acts attests to. This concept is also brought out by Jesus in Mark 10, 24-30. In verses 24-25, through 25, Jesus says, quote, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Close quote, Mark 10, 24-25. Again, we see the concept of entering the kingdom of God associated with giving up our trust in riches and thinking that what we have belongs to us alone and we can do anything we want with it. Continuing in verse 29, Jesus says, quote, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Close quote. Mark 10, 29-30. Here we see the kingdom of God is to begin in this life, and that by following the kingdom principles, we will receive a hundredfold increase now in this time. Jesus obviously wasn't talking about giving up all to receive a hundredfold vacation homes for ourselves, but to receive a hundredfold homes, food, and family relationships that would be shared with us wherever we went to do the gospel work. This gospel work would surely bring persecution, but as more and more people saw the power of the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew twenty four fourteen, in action by its adherents, the more the kingdom principles would spread throughout the whole earth. Similarly, 1 Timothy six seventeen through 19 reads, quote, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, 
who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Close quote. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 said, quote, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance may also supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Close quote, 2 Corinthians 8, 13-15. Paul promoted sharing among believers in order to bring about equality. It is not that God commands us to give everything so that we should be burdened with poverty while others gain luxury and ease, but so that we would all have enough. And again, not only enough, Jesus said a hundredfold more than we have by considering our possessions to be only our own. And of course, we have the familiar story of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through Acts chapter 5, verse 2 reads, quote, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife, also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Close quote. And you undoubtedly know the rest of the sad story. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit and did not share all they had, but selfishly kept back a portion of their proceeds for themselves. As the story tells, such cannot enter the kingdom, because the kingdom cannot operate with selfish people. We need to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. As we hear the clear truth of Jesus' teachings regarding the entire consecration of our finances and possessions to God, do we desire to hold back a part for ourselves like Ananias and Sapphira, or are we willing to do what all true believers did in the early church? Again, Acts says, quote, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Close quote. And again, Jesus said, quote, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. We'd like to leave you with one more statement from Ellen White from Review and Herald, December 8th, 1896, paragraph 11. It reads, quote, Not only does God require the tithe, but he requires that all we have be used to his glory. There must be no spendthrift habits. It is God's property that we are handling. Not one dollar or one shilling is our own. Thank you for staying with us till the end. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com to learn more about who we are and, just as important, we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath School studies. And if you want to keep up with our new studies as they're published, we recommend subscribing. We're on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on plenty of other podcast apps. Links for subscribing are in the description. God bless. Many blessings. Many blessings.